Hello everyone and welcome. Sit back, relax, make a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink and get ready for new stories from Yellow Cat. Send your own favorite stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. So subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet. Let's get started. Which examples of cheating the system do you like the most? Part 2. My employer, like many tech companies, has a rather substantive patent bonus which can be split up by two inventors with each getting the full amount and then is prorated across inventors if there's more. The patent system has this little quirk where you patent ideas and not implementations, and so the things you patent don't actually have to work. One of the product managers I know was hosting an intern and she assigned him some homework. Every week on the shuttle ride home, just dream up some crazy idea and file an invention disclosure for it, listing her as the co-inventor. These would get farmed off to patent attorneys and end up as pending patents after he left. In one summer, she made enough money to afford the down payment on a house and he made enough money to pay for college in full. And the crazy thing was that this was a win-win for everyone involved except for the American public. She and he both got large amounts of money and a large patent portfolio they can list on their resume in exchange for zero work on her part and maybe 20 to 30 hours on his. Our employer got a number of new patents for its portfolio. The lawyers build a stunning amount of hours and have more ammunition for lawsuits. And the only thing that suffers is innovation. That was my job when I was in high school. If a student's family met certain income requirements, they could get a free lunch by punching in their ID number. In case the pad broke, we could also punch in IDs. Each of our registers had a counter that showed how many lunches were sold. Our boss kept track of how many meals were made and how many were left over after lunch. It was clear to her that someone was stealing money if meals weren't recorded on the computers. She would keep a close eye on us all and even threaten to fire us all because there was a lot of interest in the job. It would be fun for many other kids to work during lunch and get a free meal or $10. My co-workers didn't want to take any risks. The food in this cafeteria was hit or miss, and more often than not, it was miss. Also, you could eat lunch anywhere on campus, so not many students ate there. There were a lot of people who got free lunches, but never used them. I remember a lot of things, so I could quickly type in about six to seven different student IDs of people I knew who never got their lunches. And I would sneakily take $5 every time someone bought a meal. Then I would scan their ID and mark up one free meal. After the $10 I made every day, this method would give me an extra $20 to $30 every day. We only worked for an hour every day. I was getting $30 to $40 an hour to work in the cafeteria at my school. My boss told me I was one of the best workers she had and that I moved the most meals most of the time. I worked there for two-thirds of high school until I graduated. I do feel like a huge jerk. It didn't bother me that I was taking money from my own high school back then because I wasn't as mature as I am now. There was a time when I had kleptomania. I'm not proud of it, but I could still sleep at night. I'm in charge of running a public hospital that's owned by the government. I learned right away that it's almost impossible to be fired. Thank the unions for that. My coworker does about one-fifth as much work as I do and are always late and sick, three to five times a month kind of sick. Almost everything we do is recorded. I can look up information about how I spent my time on any given day for anyone, but when management sees that someone spent the whole day on Facebook or Reddit, nothing's done, and I'm always the one who gets sent in to clean up their mess. I found out last week that someone had been working here for three years but had never come to work. She found a way to quit without losing her benefits. She chose to take one day off every month and got a note from her doctor saying that working in an office was too stressful for her. The flaw said you could keep your benefits as long as you work eight hours a month, which could mean giving up vacation or sick time. The best part is that I found out about all of this because she called and asked us to throw her a retirement party because she had used up all of her vacation and sick days. It's your tax money at work, but I like to say that public unions are to blame for this mess. 
I've got two. One was in an office where I had to leave for lunch and was given 30 minutes. Our time clocks only kept track of 15 minute chunks, and if you punched in or out within 7 minutes of the time, it was rounded up or down. That's why I would punch out at 1.23 and back in at 2.07 for my lunch break from 1.30 to 2 o'clock. It would only count as half an hour. After a while, they caught on, but I never got in trouble. I had another, a little sneakier plan when I was working at a dry cleaners. We had coupons for $5 off any order of $30 or more. It was hard to keep track of the coupons, and my bosses told me more than once to just take it off for some customers, even if they didn't have the coupon. So, once in a while, when no one was looking, I charged customers the full price, but made it look like they had the coupon and kept the extra $5. Do your job for a small business. Two of the boss's sons work for him and always play games with him. I have one son. Let's call him Stefan. He would spend the whole day at the beach and book time with clients whose jobs he was supposed to be doing. He once worked too late on a job and rushed to make up time. It was a huge mistake that cost the company $15,000 in extra work. Here's the reason why our business now spends around $1,000 every month on GPS devices. This same thing was done by someone else who was fired. Stefan goes through without getting hurt. Let's call the other son Fabio. The boss gives us company cars for free because they look nice and have good signs on them. He thinks that us driving around looking good is good advertising. We can use the car as much as we want within the city limits, but if we go outside the city, our boss will ask us to put diesel in it. When Fabio filled up his car's gas tank, he put a little diesel in a small drum that he kept there. He got free diesel to do whatever he pleased, and the printout that the boss saw still showed the same amount of fuel used each time. Once upon a time, I worked with a friend's dad on a job that required him to pressure clean and seal the walls in two months. The first two days we worked, we were slaves for 12 hours each. But after that, the guy I called Mini Boss planned for us to have a relaxed day. I called the guy Big Boss, who is my friend's dad, and he was busy running four different job sites. He'd stop by to see how things were going and then leave. We'd work quickly and hard for two hours, then do nothing for the rest of the day. Ahead of time, Big Boss would call Mini Boss to let him know he was coming. The moment we got that call, we'd get to work. When he showed up, we'd say we were taking a break because he let us eat whenever we wanted, so he wouldn't have to sit and watch us eat. Instead, he'd walk around, look at what we did, and leave. From where we were, we could see the expressway on-ramp perfectly. As soon as he got on it, we'd start putting our gear away in the cargo container and leave for the day. Everybody had to work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., but since Big Boss left at 12, so did we. As planned, Mini Boss was to call Big Boss at the end of the day to let him know we were leaving. However, Big Boss didn't know that Mini Boss was calling from his living room. What are the reasons people don't want to live in an HOA community? Part 2. Let's see, carriage home aka town home aka row home. Same thing, difference is property tax rates. Having to pay to have snow removed, but then having to dig your cars out and move them around like a Chinese puzzle so that the plows and other machines can get to work. Blowers for snow at 4 a.m. The people next door who don't clean up their parking and instead park in front of yours. Neighbor who works on cars in the parking lot and have a car on blocks because they're waiting for money to pay for tires while they invested $4,000 in a loud stereo for a $3,000 car. That jerk could live in both the HOA and another place. The HOA only had to send letters to enforce the rules. The owner was subletting, so... That there was always a neighbor whose kid used your patio to throw away trash. That the HOA couldn't do anything about people who broke the rules. Where I lived, the HOA told people what color, material, and plants they could have outside, but they raised fees because the building were poorly built and 24 floor joists on center. Why did they let that happen? Hearing your neighbors fight because the walls, which are supposed to be fire rated, weren't really that thick. Apartment dwellers will understand. People who cook late at night but don't use the exhaust fan set off fire alarms that woke the whole section up to the smell of bacon on the stove. Think about the bacon. 
Trees I didn't plant drop crap on my cars all the time. People in the Homeowners Association, HOA, knew that the trees, a type of locust, were a problem, but it would cost a lot of money to get rid of them and plant something else. It's awful having sap, tiny leaves, and other junk in your car's vents, etc. This place didn't have garages or covered parking. Did I say that the HOA doesn't have any power to punish noisy neighbors? When they sold their house, our monthly dues went from $60 to $250, about $20 more per month over the course of a year, mostly because snowstorms and fuel costs with lawn care. As it turned out, the outside, decks, windows, siding, and roofs was the responsibility of the residents. You might as well buy a house, which we did and found out cost more. It was clear that most of the people living where we did were single or divorced moms who wanted their kids to go to better schools. Sometimes one of the moms had a boyfriend who would break into all the cars in that section every month. The mother would eventually move on or sell her house because her neighbors were able to scare her. Or she could listen, get rid of her bad boyfriends, and focus on her kids. We were able to find a cheap condo in a very desirable area of Southern California when my wife and I bought our first home. We didn't know much about HOAs at the time, so we just paid our monthly dues and kept the CCNRs in mind. After a few years, I was asked to take over a board seat left open by a member who had died. In the end, I was elected in with six months. It wasn't too hard for me because the board mostly took care of boring maintenance issues. That is, until something terrible happened that put the whole complex in a bind and turned the board members against their neighbors. Our CCNRs say that each unit must be occupied by the owner. So one of the owners didn't read that and let a young couple and their three kids rent their unit. A brick wall common area fell on top of the mother while she was in her patio. No one really knew about it until then. She was lucky though because she only got minor injuries. The insurance plan gave us a lot of protection. The HOA lawyer told us at our next meeting that she was suing the whole association for about three times the value of the whole complex. Even worse, if she won her case, each unit would have to pay $100,000 to cover the costs above the insurance policy's limit. Everything was worked out in about a year. She paid $300,000 out of court, which was covered by our policy. Not long after that, I quit the board and sold my unit. My family and I now live in a nicer part of town in a beautiful house. The best thing about it is that there is no HOA and no shared liability. The president of the HOA lived next door to us on a wall, and he used his power to get away with crime. He built an enclosed deck without a permit. He cut the cable that ran through the backyard to the corner of his enclosed deck because he thought it looked bad. It was our cable, and when we called the cable company to come look at the problem, they found that he had cut it. They fixed it for us and left him a note. He didn't like that we fixed it, so he did it twice more and the cable company charged him for repairs. He could have just paid it like a good person would have, but instead, he billed us under the HOA, and when we fought it, he would give us violations with ridiculous fees. Trash cans on the curb past the pickup time. Lawn not mowed to the right length. Leaves and branches not picked up the same day they fell. And car parked on the street at night. Not ours or anyone else's. When we finally said we were leaving, we moved an hour and a half away and haven't looked back since. An old boss of mine used to get into fights with his neighbor behind him all the time. The neighbor's street had a homeowner's association, but my boss's street did not. The HOA side consisted of all newer houses that were constructed within the past 10 years, while his side consisted of things that were constructed in the 1950s. When he did something that was completely ridiculous, his back neighbor, BN, would always call the town on him. A project car was parked outside while he was renovating the garage, and he was working on it. There were junk cars on BN's property, according to BN's phone call to the town. I got rid of that complaint, but I left the car out there for the sole purpose of getting even with my old boss, OB, who registered and insured it so that it was no longer considered a junk car. OB was a landscaper and tree trimmer by trade, so it was within his skill set and legal for him to do because he was trimming trees near his house. 
B.N. called the town when he was trimming trees near his house. Things of this nature were passed back and forth for a number of months. B.N. has planted privacy shrubs, and O.B. was considering putting a fence up along that side as well. However, when the town came out to draw property lines, it was discovered that B.N. had encroached on his property. O.B.'s land was where the shrubs and a portion of his shed were located. At that moment, O.B. had such a sneering grin on his face as he mowed those shrubs over. The shoe was now on the other foot. Thank you for subscribing, the likes, and comments. We're very happy to see you all in the comments, too. Thanks for your support.